In part one of this series, I changed the electrolytic capacitors on a vintage 1985 10MB microcomputer memories hard disk drive. In part two, I recapped and repaired a Power General power supply which powered that drive. Today in part three, we're going to take an in-depth look at this historically significant kit, the very first internal hard drive for the Apple Macintosh, the GCC Hyperdrive. General Computer Corporation was started by fellow MIT students in 1981, selling mod kits for arcade game consoles. General Computer eventually made a Pac-Man offshoot named Crazy Auto, which ultimately became Midway's Miss Pac-Man. GCC's mod kit for Atari's Missile Command triggered lawsuits, but Atari settled by paying GCC to co-develop games like Asteroids, Centipede, Berserk, Joust, Pole Position, and many more. By 1984, though, the arcade game market was in a downward spiral, leading GCC to diversify their business by making peripherals for the newly released Apple Macintosh. The 10 megabyte hyperdrive was released in January 1985. Not only was the 10 megabyte hyperdrive the first internal hard disk for the Macintosh, hyperdrive didn't invalidate the Mac's warranty. Hyperdrive was fully compatible with the Mac's 64K ROMs and was even sold by Apple authorized dealers. There were two types of 10 megabyte drive kits offered. A more complex kit was priced at $2795 for the Macintosh 128K and included a required RAM upgrade to 512K. A lower cost $2195 kit was offered for the Mac 512. These retail prices included installation but of course did not include the price of the Mac. Later in 1987, GCC released the first quick draw personal laser printer, kickstarting a line of printing products the company continued to market until about 2008. The GCC website was finally taken down in 2015. Back in 2008, I exchanged emails with Steve Phillips, shown in this photo, who was one of the hyperdrive engineers who started working at GCC in 1985. Steve told me that Hyperdrive began as a Skunk Works project by GCC engineer Brad Parker, who allegedly cobbled together the first 10 megabyte prototype over a long weekend. Also in 2008, I received an email from Steven Shimansky, who joined GCC in 1982 and who currently works for Apple. He has an excellent collection of old GCC photos on his blog that I highly recommend checking out, many of which I've used in this video. I've also posted a link in the text description for you below. Steven confirmed that engineer Brad Parker worked out the hyperdrive's boot sequence as a hack. The hyperdrive's controller board killy clipped onto the 68000 CPU, thereby appeasing Apple to continue warranty coverage. Hyperdrive's ROM code took over and allowed direct booting from the hard drive. This was a significant improvement over Apple's own HD20 which connected to the external floppy port and could only boot after the user first inserted a special boot floppy. I purchased this Macintosh 512K with 10 megabyte hyperdrive kit installed from the original owner in March 2007 for, get this, US $71. Now I'm based in Japan, I had to pay for shipping and that was extra, and it actually cost more than this Mac did, but that was only about $77, so $148 total for this entire kit. And uh, I still, to this day, consider it quite worth it due to the rarity uh, of this particular hyperdrive kit. Now, the original owner told me that he had purchased this with the hyperdrive kit installed directly from Apple in Walnut Creek, California in the summer of 1985. He also told me that he never had it serviced or upgraded, and when I received it from him in 2007, it booted up just fine. I also did a lot of testing uh, in the making of this video to make sure it still works fine. So uh, we're going to take a closer look at this kit, but I should just add that if you haven't seen part one and part two, please be sure to check those out because I recap uh, both the hard drive and the power supply. And I should also mention that I have spoken to a number of people through the years on the 68K MLA forums, uh, even to GCC printers when their website was still up back in 2007. And I spoke to a number of GCC uh, people who used to work for GCC in the early 1980s. And all of them told me, oh, it's either a Rodime or it's a mini scribe. And that's just not true. 
Um, a later 20 megabyte version hyperdrive came out that was a different mechanism than this, and I think that's what misleads a lot of people into believing it's different. But as I described in part one, this is a microcomputer memories hard drive. It's a lesser known brand, but it does appear in volumes such as the Hyperdrive Bible. So be sure to check out part one to see more details on that. So now we're going to look at this kit a little bit more closely, and I'm going to show you exactly how it installs in the Macintosh 512K. And here is the 10 megabyte drive inside its mounting bracket. There are four rubber vibration dampeners at each side of the drive to ensure that it's not going to be hit by any major shocks, which was important uh, in these early year hard drives, as you could easily damage the drive if there was too much shock applied to it. And another benefit is that uh, the vibration of the drive itself, as it's rotating, these drives uh, vibrate quite a bit, and these dampeners lessen the impact on the Macintosh 512K. Without these dampeners, there would be much more vibration throughout the metal chassis. And here is the hyperdrive power supply inside its metal mounting bracket. I'll show you in a few moments that it actually mounts to the Mac using only one screw. And there are four little plastic retainers at each corner that secure the power supply onto this metal frame. And then there are three main connectors. Uh, this one with the standard drive power connector. Uh, this goes to the 10 megabyte hard drive. And this two wire one goes to an internal fan. And then this one supplies five volts to the controller board. And here is the hyperdrive controller. We can see that there are two ROM chips here. I haven't tried to take off the stickers, but most likely there's a little window under them where you could uh, erase them with UV light. And then we can see here, here's the five volt and ground power connector from the power supply. And then over here is our ST-412 interface. Uh, drives of that era required two cables. And then this connector will attach to what's called a Killy clip that will wrap around and go on to the 68000 MCU. And here's the 68000 Killy clip. I'm not sure why the edges look like they were melted down. Maybe that's because there was some kind of protruding piece of plastic that was incompatible with Mac motherboard mounting and they had to get rid of it. I'm not sure. But anyway, this will connect onto the 68000 CPU. And then this connector will attach r right on here like so. I'm not going to connect it right now because it's best to connect the Killy clip first and then attach this last. And here are the two ST412 cables. Uh, these connectors go to the controller board and then these will connect to the back of the hard drive. You'll notice that the cables are turned over uh, and creased actually. And they originally had this little clamp attached right here but, um, and, and of course, it was clamped that way for many, many years, so I suppose leaving it that way probably would have been fine, but I honestly don't think it's good for the wires to keep them clamped down like that. Uh, it puts undue stress on them, so it's really not necessary to have this. It makes installation some easier for novices, perhaps, but it's really not so necessary, so I just uh, remove them and intend to leave it off as I put the hyperdrive back in. As I prepare to connect the ST412 cables, I should point out that they are keyed, so you cannot put them in incorrectly, which is important for safety so you don't short out anything. You can see there's a little piece of plastic here inside this hole, and then of course right here there's no pin at all. And so that makes it easy to put the cables in correctly. Now this connector marked 110 volts AC, which is correct for Japan and the United States, attaches to this connector here. And that connector goes through this choke here into this EMI filter. Here is the LC filter circuit on the back of the EMI filter, by the way. And on the opposite side of it, that's where the high voltage is coming in. We see a 
metal oxide varistor MOV here to uh, suppress voltage spikes and then I put this little tubing around it and this goes up and the wires go through this little hole here on the analog board to the solder side but I should mention that later versions of the documentation I don't have the documentation for this earliest version so if any of you watching this video do uh, please leave a comment down below because I'd love to see that but the later version documentation says that the power wires actually solder onto components on this side of the board which uh, I'm not sure if I'm really too excited about that at all and that's probably why they did it on the solder side of the board originally. And here are the two solder points. You'll note that this is actually a newer vinyl type of solder side cover. The original Mac 128K and 512K had a paper one that was gray in color. And you can see the residuals of the two-sided tape here that was used on the original and then later it was replaced with this one. So uh, probably because of the taped covers, that was one of the reasons they, they might have made the change to go on the component side of the board instead of the solder side of the board. But still, I think doing it the soldering job on the solder side of the board is best as compared to their newer method. To remove the motherboard, we need to disconnect the 400K floppy drive cable. You know the 400K drives cables by the red stripe here. And then we want to disconnect our power cable. We can then slide up and out our motherboard. This 512K motherboard should look familiar to those of you who follow my videos. I recapped it with axial lead tantalum capacitors. The Kelly clip is marked with a white dot where pin 1 should be. We can see this little indentation marks pin 1. The hyperdrive installation guide mentions a special tool that will help mount the Killy clip, but since I don't have that, I'm going to have to just do it manually with my own eyes. As is mentioned in the hyperdrive documentation, the Killy clip is only compatible with the plastic edition 68,000 CPUs. It is not compatible with boards that use the ceramic version CPUs. You'll note that um, there's this little dark scraping areas showing where the Killy clip attached on to the 68,000 CPU in the past, showing that it's definitely making good contact with each of the pins when put on correctly. The gold pins of the Killy clip seem to be making contact with the silver pins of the 68000 CPU, but we need to use our meter to be sure. So with the board on top of my green anti-static mat and with myself grounded, I am going to do a continuity check with my meter, which will beep like that whenever two wires are connected together. So I'm going to put a little wire in each one of these. It's tedious to do, but I'm just going to make sure, absolutely sure, that the Kelly, Kelly clip is on there good. So I'm going to measure from the underside of the board. Not measure, but just touch. And so that one pin is done. And then I can go over and test for the next one. And I should mention that my meter also shows me ohms. So if I'm getting something higher than zero ohms, it will tell me. And that can usually be indicative of a bad connection. But it says zero ohms on my meter, so it's okay. Now that the continuity check is done, everything is perfect in regards to the Killy clip, it's time to put on the controller board. Two plastic screws were included. 
and they go into the holes on either side of the board here. And we put them in through the bottom. with a flathead screwdriver. And here it is, the one that we put the screw in. Now on this side it's just a spacer with, because there's no hole in the board, so actually this can come up if it were actually moved. But um, that's normally not a problem because this gravity is going to pull it down. So it's spaced just perfectly right so that the top of the killy clip will not come in contact with the bottom of the controller board. And of course the overall thickness of this board will just fit into the chassis of the Mac 512. And lastly we need to secure our connector here. The next step is to install our power supply into this open slot here. It mounts with a single Torx screw here. And since we'll be working with metal objects in close proximity to the CRT yoke, it's always good to discharge the CRT even though this analog board has a 157-0042B um, flyback with bleeder resistor inside. It's always still a good idea to do it yourself. And uh, just a touch, I have my alligator clip onto a flathead screwdriver also connected down here to the ground lug and the computer is not powered. I will now connect the power from our EMI filter here. This is going to be 110 volts. There's a lot of metal here. You don't want it to be slammed up against your glass CRT so you got to be really careful with it when you're putting it in. And even though you're going to need a Torx to finally screw him in, it's best to have a magnetic tipped screwdriver. My Torxes are not magnetic. Have a magnetic screwdriver so that you can at least insert him into the hole. And maybe screw him a little bit just to hold him in. And then you can take your Torx and finish the job. This is the original mounting bracket affixed with two-sided tape to the top of the 400K drive's aluminum sled here. I did not remove that, of course, because there was no need to. It says 3M on it right here. This is for the mounting of this ferrite core choke. And as you can see, I already cut off the original uh, wire tie, so I'm going to need to add a new one here. Now we need to prepare to mount the hard drive in this open space here, but we have to keep cable management in mind. There are three specific cables. The one I have pushed back here will go into the power connector on the hard drive because the hard drive will mount with its connectors here. Then we have our floppy drive cable which will go underneath this mounting bracket. And then we have a 5 volt cable that will need to go in this hole here. Now there are three screws, one, two, three, that are used to mount this. These two screws on the bottom will mount on these holes here and here. And then this screw up here will go into this drilled out hole in the 400K drives frame. So again, this is the bottom part. We'll mount vertically. but There's a little hole in here so we can feed our floppy drive cable 
through and that way he won't be smashed and I have my motherboard 5 volt controller board 5 volt out of the way and then place him here like so and then this flap goes underneath just barely underneath the 400k drive bracket and we line up the hole like so the other point of consideration is this EMI filter also needs to be mounted here rather precariously <laughs> by only one side and not two that's I don't have the original manual for this and so again if any of you do I'd love for you to send that to me but uh, the way it came back in 2007 when I acquired this kit was just like so with the hyperdrive bracket underneath and this mounted here Then we have our two bottom screws. The lip of this frame doesn't quite fit under an 800K drive because this frame was made for the 400K drive sleds. You can see I've got the screw laid down back here. So you can actually screw down this filter onto the lip but actually that's not a good thing to do because this frame really does need to be tucked under the drive and screwed down. And you'll see that the two stock holes don't quite align. So the only thing you could do would be bend this towards the drive and then you're gonna have to bend this little lip down a bit and then you'd have to drill another hole in your 800K drive uh, to make sure it would fit that way. Now I'm not going to do that because I want to pair this with a 400K drive. Now it's time to install our motherboard. We have three points of consideration. First, we need to connect our plus five volts and ground power to this connector here, but at the same time, feed these two ribbon cables through this hole. And we will not be able to slide in the motherboard because of this daughter card that's on here. So we're going to have to use a flathead screwdriver to basically pry in the motherboard. want to put in our floppy cable and now for the drive power connector we can now connect our cables to the drive and now the main power on the motherboard and last but not least we want to mount our ferrite here this will go to power the fan
This is the back of the 512's case. An internal hyperdrive cooling fan was placed just on the opposite side of these air vents. Quite important because in the early days the 128K and the 512K did not have a fan and they were cooled completely by convection and that's why we have all of these air vents here. The heat rises and so the thinking was that the heat would simply come up and out. And uh, for the most part that was true but Without a fan and with the addition of the internal hard drive, it would get quite hot inside, so the fan was quite important. And here is the fan on the inside of the case. We can see the controller here, and this is the two-wire uh, power connector. And I'm not going to remove this because it's affixed with Velcro, but in the process of removing it, I'm probably going to rip off the existing Velcro that's on there, so I'm just going to leave it on here for now. As you can see, the fan is a four-wire fan, and uh, the controller says Buhler, a German word, made in Germany. I don't have any details on this kit. No doubt there's a part number if I were to remove the fan, but uh, if any of you have a data sheet <laughs> on something similar to this, that would be great to look at. You can leave me a comment down below. But I was able to use a brush and clean out all of the dust and the fan is working fine. So um, I should only mention that in later kits, in the installation guide for hyperdrive, it talks about a mounting bracket. So in the later versions, I guess they used uh, an actual bracket to better route air uh, up and out through the vents. And before putting on the back case, it's important to do just an initial test. We're going to call it the smoke test because if I did anything wrong, well, who knows? The smoke could come out. Uh, I just have the mouse in on the back. That way I can shut down the computer once it boots up. So here it goes. Wow, we got it. And it booted right to the desktop. Woohoo! We can now plug in the fan wires. And this is keyed, so it'll only go in one way, not the other. And we just have to be careful when putting the back case back on because we don't want to pinch these wires in the seam of the case, which would be a problem. I should mention that when taking off the case and putting it back on, there are Torx T15 screws that you're going to have to deal with. One's under here, the battery door, and you have two down in the handle. You need a fairly long Torx T15 to do that, and I have been using for many, many years this particular one, which is just basically a bent Torx wire. But I can't find this sold anywhere, so what I did recently is I purchased another one. This particular one is found on Amazon. It even says it's made in the USA. It has a little protective cap at the end. This is also Torx T15. I put a link to this new one down in the text description below. It provides just enough length for you uh, to get the case off because it'll have to go down deep in the handle. So it's just, it's just enough to uh, get the screw in there. And the T-shape the at the top lets you apply enough force. So you actually have to be more careful with this one than you do these old wire types because you, you can't really apply very much force on these. So I just wanted to mention that to help you out when you're opening your Mac case. Now let's take a look at the software. We'll switch the power on. And uh, Hyperdrive is unique and differentiates itself from other drives of the era like the Apple HD20 by not requiring any floppy base booting and just automatically boots from the internal hard drive, which we take for granted today, but back in 1985, this was really special. Now the hyperdrive manual 
says that the hyperdrive Macintosh is just as easy to use as the regular Macintosh, and it lets you do all of the things you can ordinarily do with your computer. I take issue with that because that's really more marketing hype than anything else, and I'm now going to show you why. If we were to shut down, and if I boot from a 400K floppy, you would expect intuitively that no matter what floppy you put in, the hyperdrive should just mount. Like any other vintage Mac, and certainly like a modern Mac, your hyperdrive should mount, or at least so you would think. But in reality, that's not the case. If you look at the desktop, we only see the 400K drive. The hyperdrive is nowhere to be found. And that's really the caveat with the hyperdrive. For every floppy disk that you want to use and boot from, if you want to have your hyperdrive accessible, you will have to use their hyperinstall software to install all of the necessary drivers into the system file. Now, thankfully, I did that on this particular floppy, and so I go up to the Apple menu and choose a command called Drawers, and then what that will do is add a new menu item over here called Drawers. And then I can choose Startup. And it takes a little time here, but it mounted the startup of the hyperdrive. Okay. And we can also use that uh, to drag it to the trash, which will eject Startup. And there's another partition on here, which is, which is called a drawer. In, in GCC lingo, it's called a drawer. And uh, it opened that right up as well. But again, you need to have the drivers installed for that to work. Now let's go back and do a shutdown. And what's going to happen here is if I do not put in any other disk and just leave the computer as it is, the computer actually doesn't shut down. You can see that it had no automatic power down in this era of Macintosh. And so what it does is basically just restarts. And then you have time after the beep. You can turn off power if you like. But if you don't, then it's going to boot just like this. Now what you put on your hyperdrive is largely up to you. But there are certain incompatible systems and other things that you need to be aware of. But basically, I put all of this software on it. So I'm going to go ahead now and show you some of the basic software apps that are used by the hyperdrive. The first and perhaps most important one, once you have installed the hyperinstall software, is the Manager app. And this is version V2R1. Now the Manager app will allow you to do basic testing, initialization. So if there's a problem with the drive, and in fact, the reason this video took so long for me to come out with is I actually had a number of problems that were not related to my recapping, but just had to do with data integrity. And ultimately, what I had to do was an initialized disk, which is a format, a complete erasure of the disk itself in order to make it work correctly. And they, it has a built-in help file, so you don't need to access paper manuals. And it goes through and tells you basically what the functions do. You have access to the drawers. And you have in the Create menu over here uh, a variety of commands. You can create a new drawer. And again, drawers are partitions. If we create another drawer, we can call it My drawer, for example. We are then given the option to password protect it, but leaving it blank will not password protect it. I don't want to do that. And now we have a new one called My Drawer. And so if we just quit the program here and go back to the desktop, that's the only way to see the contents of the drawers, is to get back to the desktop, then it will have the drawer mounted over here. And it says 32K in disk, 
and basically it dynamically resizes. Remember, this is a 10 megabyte hard drive. And we can see up here it's 2.2 megabytes, 2268K is 2.2 megabytes in the, of software already in it, and about 7.18 megabytes are available. So what's going to happen here is if we were to copy software over to the drawer, it will start the copy process. And even though this is a hard drive, it is by no means speedy in this era of Macintosh. It does take a while even for some basic files. And if you're coming from a modern computer, you will be frustrated to tears. But if you're into vintage Macs, then you should be used to this level of speed by now. Remember, this is a slow 68,000 processor that we're talking about. Okay, and so now it says 180K in disk, and it says 5.688 megabytes available, which is a bit odd, you might think, because it says, wait a minute, this startup drawer is 7 megs, 7 plus 5, how is that possible? Well, there are a lot of things about the hyperdrive that I cannot necessarily explain, but uh, basically you're not going to get more than 10 megabytes total. And it dynamically allocates the size. So if you keep pouring documents into this drawer, then it is going to take your available space of your startup volume, and that will slowly decrease, which is kind of neat. So let's go back into the manager now, and let's say that uh, we changed our minds and we really don't want that drawer. By the way, you might ask, why do we even need drawers anyway? Isn't it just less complicated to create one? I mean, it's only 10 megs anyway, right? Well, why not just uh, create only one drawer, just have your system? Why, do, why have multiple drawers? I'm going to go ahead and delete my drawer now. And it says, are you sure? And yes. And the answer is, back in these early days, you could only store so many files on the computer. And if you exceeded a certain number of files, it would begin to slow down. And so they suggest, a GCC in the documentation, suggests that you create a startup drawer, which is what we have right now, which is why it's dimmed out up here. And you put only the system files on there. And then you create other drawers, for example, for MacWrite, you create a different drawer for graphics programs and so on. And I've not done that yet, but basically that's going to ensure that the computer boots up faster if you do that. So we have preferences in the create section here, and it says mount only the startup drawer. This is not talking about booting, this is talking about mounting. You can only boot from the startup drawer. So if that gets damaged, it's not going to boot. And that was part of the problem that I haven't showed you on this video, but I lost some of the original files because they had a problem with the startup drawer. Anyway, uh, this will allow you to start up only with the startup drawer, and that's usually recommended for sheer speed. And then you can allow the deletion of the startup drawer, which is usually not a good idea because once that's gone, then you'll lose booting. And then it says, when creating a drawer, allocate directory space for. 128, 256, or 512 files. So basically your upper end is only 512 files. Now in the, in the era of Mac OS X, you've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of files, which is totally different concept from back in these days. But basically, you can see how limiting it was. And to be honest, you really didn't need a whole lot of files back in, in these days. So uh, it wasn't quite as limiting as you think. And each file is, is quite small, too. But I have left it on the default because the smaller number of files that you choose, uh, the overall performance will be better. And then it says allocate RAM for drawer mounting and disk caching. And then it's saying down here, it's recommended you either put them both on or take them both off, although it's really your choice. Uh, but this, again, will accelerate things. So yeah, what you've been seeing now is actually the cached and accelerated performance of hyperdrive. But if you can take you can take off the caching because it says it for maximum compatibility, some software may not be compatible with it. I haven't found a problem so far, 
but uh, it has that option. And if we look in the hyperdrive manager about box, it tells us a lot of interesting information about my hyperdrive. The ROM version is 103, driver is 181, boot track 4414, manager release is 700, hard disk size is 10 megabytes, hyperdrive serial number even, it tells you 2987, and the unused disk space is about 5.888 megabytes. And of course you have even more help files. You can go in here and it will tell you basically what I've just told you. So that is the manager program. And uh, really, for the most part, the, the main use of that is to mount or unmount drawers. Although if you do install the hyperdrive software, you get a little desk accessory here to do the same thing. The next program is called HyperTools. And I actually got this off a newer version of the hyperdrive software. This is version 1.1. And there's a lot of software on Macintosh Garden, actually three versions of the HyperDrive software, but there actually were more released. So if any of you have software versions on Floppy that are not already on the Macintosh Garden, it'd be great if you could upload those. Uh, when I first purchased this Macintosh, I did not get any floppies with it. So just, just to let you know. And this version of HyperTools, it's again saying version 1.1 from 1986. Uh, over here, we've got drawer tools. The drawer tools will also let you optimize the drawer. It gives you more of a gra graphical representation. Back in the early 1980s, people really didn't visualize files as digital files. They preferred filing cabinet type of paper. Uh, skeuomorphism, I guess it's called. And uh, it helps people to visualize how much space was used and how much space was free. And it's saying the combined total space used is 3.8 megabytes. There's also an interesting, <laughs> uh, we're talking about skeuomorphism, parking, uh, park heads. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. And, uh, this is if you're going to uh, tote your Mac around. You know, I, this is early days, folks. So back in these days, the drives were still quite new. So they didn't have head parking that was automatic. And so you had it done through software. You manually had to go in and park the heads, which means it's going to put them in a place where if you jolt the drive, it's not going to have the head slam against any data and technically ruin uh, the data on the disk. And so now it's saying, okay, now that the heads are parked, you would actually not shut down anything. You would just flip off the power here, and then you could take your Mac with you. But we're not going to do that. We're going to click on Park. And that's the two commands here. Versions gives you a lot of data about the Mac. This is telling me that the ROMs I have in here are 64K. They're B-type ROMs. And the system file is 3.3. And I have 512K of RAM in the computer. And then it's telling you more about the hyperdrive system software, the boot track version, drawers version, hard disk driver. Hyperdrive ROM version is 1.03. So you can see I have a very, very early version. And I'm not sure what the newer version ROMs on the hyperdrive controller will afford me. Or even if they, even if you have, for example, newer ROM code that I could burn into my existing ROM chips, would that new ROM code be compatible with the early revision board that I have? I don't know. But I'd, I'd love to engage you folks down in the comments, especially if some of you worked for GCC and perhaps would know that. And then RAM disk driver, we're not using RAM disk now, so it doesn't say anything. And then we have the preferences set for hyperdrive, and it even tells you the version number of the cache. <laughs> Trap dispatcher, you know, something programmers would know. These very early days, 1.00, 1.02. And then it even gives you serial port information. So it's showing here, well, right now my mouse is connected, but I don't have anything else connected in the back. And that's basically it besides the help file. Um, this really has the most extensive 
help system in it and it explains everything in great detail, which is very convenient and nice. So you don't have to reference the paper manual. You don't always have that manual with you. And it even says you can save the help to a file. So you don't even need this software to use it if you save it out to a file. So you also have a backup program. The backup program in these days would back up your hyperdrive to floppy disks. So you can see the representation of the floppies here. And it also, of course, naturally has the restore feature as well. Uh, we're not going to do any backups. I just wanted to show you that you've got to compare, restore, backup, and then help file to help you understand how to use it. Okay, and then the last program I'm going to show you here is the security. You can encrypt or decrypt. It kind of goes without saying that's what you're going to be able to do. Uh, and how strong the encryption is, it doesn't go into details on that, but again, these were early days, folks, so I'm sure a hacker could uh, break that encryption probably pretty easy these days, assuming they had the right software. But it did include this security program for people who wanted to lock down the files on the hyperdrive. Now, what I really wanted to show you, and I spent hours and days trying to figure it out and trying to make it work. And you might say, wait a minute, system 6.0.3 on a Macintosh 512K, is that even possible? Well, yes. I found a Dog Cow's great blog, which explained how to hack the system file to be able to do it. But <laughs> the problem is that even though I was able to boot System 6, um, it has a lot of problems. And I don't know really what that is, but basically I'll show you here by booting off of my floppy. I installed the System and Finder, System 6.0.3, and uh, Finder 6.1, I believe, on the a dedicated drawer in the hyperdrive. And so right, what I'm gonna do now is this floppy will allow me to access that drawer. So I go to Drawers, and then I can choose System 6.0.3, and in these early days, uh, if you clicked on any app that was on a particular floppy disk, or in this case, a hard drive partition, normally what would happen is when you launch the app, the system and finder, which are contained in your system folder here, they would become the dominant system and finder. So I load an app here. Theoretically, it should allow system six to take over, load an app here, it should allow earlier whatever the system and finder is on this floppy disk to take over. But I'm going to double click Mac right and show you what happens. It looks like it's working, but then it gives a system bomb with ID equals 12. And I believe it's at this point that system six was trying to take over, but it couldn't. And yes, by the way, I did the implementation and res edit correctly exactly as the dog cow blog said, but still for a situation like this, it just could be a hyperdrive incompatibility or something like that. I'm not exactly sure, but it gives a system bomb. So I have a floppy EMU and on my floppy EMU, I have system six on a 400K floppy. Yes, you can actually make it that small. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to restart with the mouse button held down so I can eject the internal floppy, but boot from my floppy EMU. So now my floppy EMU, the LED is flashing. It's got a happy face. Folks, this is showing you that System 6 really can be booted on a Macintosh 512K. Quite impressive. But unfortunately, this is a 400K disk, 
I cannot boot off an 800K floppy on this computer. It only has 59K available. It doesn't have enough space to hold the hyperdrive software, so there is no drawers command that will allow me to do anything. I don't have enough space on the disk to run anything else. Now I can put in a, a real floppy into the internal drive here and then try to load Mac write from off of this floppy. And so when we quit now, you will see we're back here. Nothing is crashing, but again, I just don't have the ability to load the hyperdrive software. And it says in order for you to install the hyperdrive software, you have to have the hyperinstall v2r1 application on the disk that you want to install it into the system. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. You would think you could be able to put it on another disk and then say, I want you to install on this particular disk, but no, it wants you to actually save it, which eats up space. And then when you install it, it eats up even more space. You see? So there's a lot of caveats to this software, and it really makes it rather complicated to use. So my, my intention was, the reason I, I talked to many people on one of our vintage Apple Macintosh enthusiasts Facebook group, and thank you for those who replied back to me on that, 68K MLA, talking to a lot of people how to resolve different problems. But basically, I was looking for an application. I have utilities in here, and I was looking for an application that could do bench testing, because I wanted to show you how much faster the hyperdrive is compared to a floppy. So I downloaded Disk Timer. Uh, there was a discussion on the 68K MLA, and basically it was recommended that I use Disk Timer or Disk Bench, and I was able to find both. But they both give the same result, only about 24 kilobytes per second, which is far too slow, even for the floppy drive. But it was also reporting that on the hard drive as well. So this, for some reason, is not reliable when testing the hyperdrive. And I was thinking, OK, well, what other than this could I use on pre-System 6 software? And nobody had any idea. And I honestly, even though I had a Mac 128 back in the day, I can't remember. So everybody was saying, just install System 6. But as I've just shown you, that is not a feasible option. It just doesn't work in conjunction with the hyperdrive. So I cannot run any newer a program like speedometer I tried it bombs out on this older OS so <laughs> what I did is I was reading online there was some test results that were published and basically they would clock the opening of MacWrite 4.5 they would time it to see how fast it would open. So I'm going to do that now with my stopwatch. I'm going to double click and then start it. And I'm going to stop it when I see the little eye beam in the upper left corner. It says eight seconds. So now we're going to put in my floppy. because this floppy has MacWrite 4.5 on it. Sixteen seconds. Okay. So, well, uh, it's about twice as fast as a floppy. It should be a lot faster than that, you would think, because 3,600 RPM on the hyperdrive is faster in rotational speed than the upper end 600 RPM, that's the maximum rotational speed, of the 400K floppy drive. 
the speed results that I found online, I put into this document here. It, someone did this back in 1985 and they said that, these are all in seconds here. They said that the Hyperdrive Mac 512 did it in eight seconds, which interestingly matches what I got. But they said that the regular Mac 512 with Sony floppy drive took 24 seconds. But in my case, I only got 16. They even did a test with a Lisa, five megabyte hard drive, 12 seconds. They did a 10 megabyte hard drive, 20 seconds. So these are from fastest to the slowest. And they repeated the test five times and got pretty much, well, except for their first test, which is a little bit slower, they got fairly consistent results. You'll notice that um, even though they did multiple tests, they still got 24 seconds. So I'm not sure why my timing is faster. But anyway, as you can see, the hyperdrive is faster, but it's not substantially faster than the floppy, even though this is a processor direct connection. It's not SCSI. It's not on the IWM chip. It's not on the floppy system. It is directly to the 68000 processor, so it should be significantly faster, but perhaps it's just the slow speed of the hard drive itself. And so if any of you have a hyperdrive or you have experience with some of the newer versions, I'm not going to show that in this particular video because I don't want to make it too long, but basically there are newer versions than this particular software. I chose this one because it's lighter weight in terms of RAM than, in, than the two newer versions that are on the Macintosh Garden. But um, uh, basically, if you want to see more or want to know more about the hyperdrive or have me test something, please let me know down in the comments. So I'll close with some missile command since it was GCC who basically started out with missile command to begin with. The simplicity of the game makes me wonder how it actually was so popular. I suppose it's different on a Mac than it was in the actual arcade, but uh, this is really how the guys at MIT got their start. And that brings this video series to a close. If you missed one or both of the first two segments, be sure to expand out the text description below because I put links to those videos for you there, as well as links to other hyperdrive related resources that I think you'll find interesting. If you were affiliated with GCC and the hyperdrive project in the 1980s, I'd certainly love to hear from you down in the comments. And if you simply have a Macintosh 512K with internal hyperdrive or even a Macintosh Plus with a hyperdrive inside, I'd love to hear your comments and especially see some photos of your drive and its controller. You can post free photos to places like Flickr or another cloud service online. I don't block links in the comments, so feel free to post a link to your photos there. If you'd like to contact me privately, all you have to do is click on my JDW name, which will take you to my channel. And at my channel, there's an About tab, A-B-O-U-T. Click on that, scroll down, and you'll be able to find my email address. I'd now like to take some time to thank three very special people who kindly contributed to this channel by PayPal in the month of March 2021. First, Rami from Copenhagen, Denmark. Next, I'd like to thank Mozam Raja from Cupertino, California. And lastly, I'd like to thank Maro Ashiakaferi. Thank you, gentlemen, for your gracious support towards making this channel better. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not already subscribed, please subscribe and then be sure to click the bell notification so that you're alerted to any new videos that I come out with. Thank you for watching, folks, and I wish each of you a great day.